My name is Pastor Hal York, and we'd like to welcome you to our online service here at Hastings Park Bible Church. It's July the 11th, and we're glad you could join us. Now, we will be meeting this morning in person out in the parking lot, and uh, you're more than welcome to join us if you're watching this early enough to come. But uh, we will be meeting outside again. We had a great week, great Sunday last week, great turnout, and great to see people we haven't seen in a while. So it was just a great time. We're going to be doing that probably the rest of the month, weather permitting. And uh, we'll end it in the uh, last Sunday in July for, the, for now anyway. But just a couple of announcements. A reminder that we are having prayer meeting as well on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. And uh, you're more than welcome to join us then. So you're studying the Lord's Prayer. And uh, then Thursday, Thursday, Karen's Bible study meets at 7. And we have a little Bible study downstairs for the men. Very informal, casual. But if you'd like to come join us, we'd love to have you. Do We're reading through the Gospel of John and then... Uh, we're on chapter 5 this week. If you'd like to join us, and uh, we'd love to have you come just to have a time of prayer afterwards. It's a great time of fellowship. This morning, I just want to read from Isaiah chapter 45, then we're going to jump into Psalm 139 again and resume our study in that great psalm. But you just ask God's blessing upon our time together this morning. Lord, we are grateful for your goodness. We're grateful for your mercy, and we thank you for your presence here with us today, and we just pray that you'll just bless us as we study your word, as we read your word, that we would see you high and lifted up, that we would get a glimpse of, of your greatness, of your majesty, and Father, we just realize, Lord, how great you truly are, and we, when we think about trying to describe it with words, words fail us. That we pray in some small way this morning that we might just remind us of, of who you truly are, and and, uh, and we just pray as we read this passage of Scripture before us, as we open your word together, that you might touch hearts. That if some are watching this this morning who have never come to know God as their Lord and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, the Emmanuel, God with us, who came into this world to seek and to save the lost. And we pray that you might open their hearts and their minds to the truth of your great saving love that you bestowed upon those and you came to save. And, and so, Father, we pray that you might seeking you a savior, a refuge from their sin, a savior from sin, and which you provided in your son, Jesus Christ. So as we read this passage this morning in Isaiah 45, I pray that you might just again cause our hearts to be lifted up, that we might again be reminded of who you are, and as we look at Psalm 139, that you might just open our, expand our minds, uh, give us the wisdom, fill us with your spirit, that we may be in some small way get, get a fresh glimpse of the greatness and the grandeur of who you are, and we ask these things in Jesus' wonderful name, amen. We're going to be reading from Isaiah chapter 45 this morning, a wonderful chapter, and we'll start reading at verse 1. And it says here, he's speaking to the Cyrus, an, un an ungodly king, but just think about what he says to this king as we read this chapter. Thus says the Lord to Cyrus, his anointed, whom I have taken by the right hand to subdue nations before him and to loose the loins of kings, to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. I will go before you and make the rough places smooth. I will shatter the doors of bronze and cut through their iron bars. I will give you the treasure of darkness and hidden wealth of secret places so that you may know that it is I. The Lord, the God of Israel, who calls you by your name, for the sake of my, Jacob, my servant, and Israel, my chosen one, I have called you also. I have called, also called you by your name. I have given you a title of honor, though you have not known me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Beside me, there is no God. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that men may know from the rising to the setting of the sun that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. The one forming light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating calamity, I am the Lord who does all these. Drip down, O heavens, from above and let the clouds pour down righteousness. Let the, Lord, let the earth open up and salvation bear fruit and righteousness spring up with it. I, the Lord, have created it. Woe to the one who quarrels with his maker, an earthen vessel among the vessels of the earth. 
Will the clay say to the potter, what are you doing? Or the thing you are making say, he has no hands? Woe to him who has says to his father, what are you begetting? Or to a woman, to what are you giving birth? Thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and his maker, ask me about the things to come concerning my sons, and you shall commit me to me the work of my hands. It is I who made the earth and created man upon it. I stretched out the heavens with my hands and I ordained all their host. I have aroused him in righteousness and I will make all his ways smooth. He will build my city and will let my exiles go free without any payment or reward, says the Lord of hosts. Thus says the Lord, the products of Egypt and the merchandise of Cush and the Sabians men of stature will come over to you and will be yours. They will walk behind you, and they will come over in chains, and they will bow down to you. They will make supplication to you. Surely God is with you, and there is none else, no other God. Truly you are a God who hides himself, O God of Israel, Savior. They will be put to shame and even humiliated, all of them. The manufacturers of idols will go away together in humiliation. Israel has been saved by the Lord with an everlasting salvation. You will not be put to shame or humiliated to all eternity. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, He is the God who formed the earth and made it. He established it and did not create it a waste place, but formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is none else. Then he jumped down to verse 21 and says, Declare and set forth your case. Indeed, let him consult together. Who has announced this from old? Who has long since declared it? Is it not I, the Lord? And there is no other God beside me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none except me. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone forth from my mouth in righteousness, and I will not turn back. To me, every knee shall bow, and every tongue will swear allegiance, that they will say of me, only in the Lord are righteousness and strength. Men will come to him, and all who are angry at him will be put to shame. In the Lord, all the offspring of Israel will be justified and will glory. What a wonderful passage of Scripture. May God bless the reading of his word to our hearts. If you have your Bibles now, I'd ask you to turn to Psalm 139, and we're going to continue our study in this great psalm. It's an amazing psalm. We've looked at the first six verses over the last four or five weeks. And when we started our journey through this psalm, we mentioned that the knowledge of God is inexhaustible. When we come to psalms like this or the passage that we just read in Isaiah 45 or really any passage, we are sort of like children with a thimble running to the ocean and filling it with water and running back to our parents saying, look at the ocean, and we're showing them the little thimble with, with salt water in it. And that's how it is when we study theology, when we, the study of God. We can never truly comprehend the majesty, the greatness, and the awesomeness of God, especially with minds that are still tainted with sin. Even for all eternity, our minds will not grasp the magnitude, the greatness, and the majesty of God. The more we understand, the more we realize how little we really know. But we long to know more. We long to know him. And I pray that you long to know God more and more each day. The Bible tells us about how great God is, but it could never set forth on paper or in words how great he truly is. It cannot express the greatness of God in paper and words. You cannot set forth his image. That's why he says in the first three commandments, I shall not have any graven image. There's no way we can convey God by an image or by a picture. To do so, even to describe him in words, is to almost make him less than he, than he really, truly is. 
But that doesn't mean we can't know him. He's incomprehensible in one respect, but we, do, there are, well, we can learn something of him, and that's what our quest has been and should be throughout our life. But the Bible sets forth the majesty of God, but again, it does not capture the full essence of that majesty. The same is true for the splendor of God, the beauty of God, the holiness of God, the power of God, and on and on we could go. But there are some attributes of God the Bible sets forth that are awesome and great as they are portrayed in Scripture, but the reality of them is beyond our ability to fully grasp. These are the subjects that will captivate our minds and hearts for eternity. And when you're preaching a sermon like this, my first response is to just maybe I should just read the passage and be quiet. Because sometimes I feel like I'm trying to describe something. I'm in a whirlpool and I've just got my hand up. I'm trying to stay above water here. Because these concepts are so vast that my little pea brain cannot wrap their minds around it in a way that I feel adequately enough in any way to convey the greatness and the awe of God that we see in this psalm and really that we see portrayed throughout Scripture. Remember that wonderful third verse in that old hymn, The Love of God? The third verse reads, Could we with ink the ocean fill, and were the skies of parchment made? Were every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade? To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. Nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. I think that captures the essence of trying to understand the love of God. You cannot possibly exhaust it, and that's true of every one of God's attributes, his majesty, his grace, his power, his beauty, his wisdom. One theologian has put it this way, it's not, it is not only true that we can never fully understand God, it is also true that we can never fully understand any single thing about God. There's no one aspect of God that we can ever understand fully. Most people think, well, the love of God, I think I got that one figured out, but you really don't. We'll never truly grasp, and that's what the songwriter is trying to say, no one can ever fully grasp the depth, the width, the breadth, and the height of the love of God. We think about his greatness. In Psalm 145, 3, it says, Great is the Lord and highly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. His understanding, Psalm 147, 5, Great is our Lord and abundant in strength. His understanding is infinite. It has no end. His riches, his wisdom, his judgments, and his ways. Isaiah 55, 9 says, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And Paul, in that great doxology in Romans 11, says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who became his counselor, or who, or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. These are above all above our ability to, to understand fully and really to understand and really, and it's just this tiny, tiny concept. It's almost beyond our mind, ability of our minds to grasp. We may know something about them, but we can never know them fully. All we can do is, is cry out with Paul in Philippians 4.10 that I might know him, that I might know him. Jeremiah 9, 23, 24 says, Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast of his wisdom, let not the mighty man boast of his might, let not the rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth, for I delight in these things, declares the Lord. 
Paul or David said in Psalm 27, 4, One thing I have asked of the Lord that I, may, that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. David prayed in 1 Chronicles 29, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you were exalted as head above all. And the more we learn, the more we grasp of the greatness and the majesty and the holiness of God. All we can really do is say with David in verse 6, Psalm 139, Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain to it. It's just too high. So as we said when we started our study, nothing shapes our lives and the lives of our children more than our theology, than our understanding of who God is. In Psalm 139, we are confronted with truths about God we do not think about as much as we should. We know God is great, and yes, God is good, and God is powerful and merciful and loving. But in Psalm 139, we are reminded of aspects of God's character and being we do not talk about or think about as often as we should. They are on every page of Scripture, but here they are laid out for us to contemplate, to meditate. And I think that's what David is doing here. He's basically setting forth some principles, some truths about God's essence, God's being. And then he just allows him to wash over his life as he meditates upon him and thinks about the implications of such glorious truth. So let's read verses 1 to 12 as we get started to remind us of this wonderful passage. Verse 1. O Lord, you have searched and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, even, behold, O Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me, and such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain to it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me, and your right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me, and the light around me will be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. And the, and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. We've spent four or five weeks looking at verses 1 to 6 where we, he sets forth really the omniscience of God, that God is all-knowing, that there's nothing outside of God's realm of understanding and knowledge. He knows everything about everything. And he, David goes on to talk about what that means. But now verses 7 to 12 talk about another aspect of God's essence. His omnipresence. And I want to give you three words to help us capture what the psalmist is telling us about God. And again, these are very huge concepts. These are hard for us to wrap our mind around. And as I said, I feel like I'm a child holding a thimble with water and trying to tell you about the, mag the majesty of the ocean by pointing at the thimble. That's all I can get my mind around. These are huge, vast concepts that stretch our mind that we really fully can't grasp as finite beings. But let me give you three words that help us to understand what David is telling us in these verses. The first word is transcendence. And what that means is that God is greater than and independent of creation. He is separate from the universe. He's not part of it. But he is entirely above it. God exists 
outside of the universe. God is not part of the universe. This is, the universe is part of his creation. He created it. He's bigger than the creation of the universe. He's separate from the universe. He's not part of it. The word eminence is the next one. It refers to the fact that God transcends and fills all space. God is everywhere present at the same time. He's everywhere present at the, at the same time and in the same essence. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And then omnipresence indicates that God is present with every point of space in his entire being. There's nowhere in God's created universe where God is not fully present. One theologian back in the late 18, was 1879, wrote, The psalmist speaks of God as a person everywhere present in creation, yet distinct from creation. God, as we've talked about earlier, no one created God. God is eternal. He has no beginning and he has no end. He's distinct from creation. In these verses, he says, Thy spirit, thy presence Thy hand, thy right hand. God is everywhere, but everything is not God. He's not, David's not being a pantheist here where he says God is, everything is God. No, he's not saying that at all. He's simply saying God is everywhere, but not every, everything is not God. God is distinct from his creation. Stephen Charnock said, As eternity is a perfection in which God is neither beginning nor end, Immutability is a perfection by which God neither increases nor diminishes. He's unchangeable. So omnipresence is that by which God has neither bounds nor limitations. God inhabits eternity. God is above his creation. Let me read a passage in Isaiah. It's a rather long one, but I think it helps us to understand this concept and understanding of God a little bit more better than I could ever do with my words. So in Isaiah 40, we read verse 12, Who has measured the water in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens by the span? He's saying basically the span of his hand, God can measure the universe with his hand. Holds the the waters of the world in his hand, the palm of his hand. They're just there. There's nothing. He's calculated the dust of the earth by measure and weighed the mountains in a balance and the hills on a pair of scales. Who has directed the spirit of the Lord who has, or as his counselor has informed him? With whom did he consult and who gave him understanding? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and informed him of the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are regarded as a speck of dust in the scales. Behold, he lifts up the islands like fine dust. Even Lebanon is not enough to burn, nor its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are regarded by him as less than nothing and meaningless. To whom then will you liken God? Or to what likeness will you compare with him? As for the idol, a craftsman casts it, and a goldsmith plates it with gold. A silversmith fashions chains of silver. He who is too impoverished for such an offering selects a tree that does not rot. He seeks out for himself a skilled craftsman to prepare an idol that will not totter. Do you know? Have you not heard? Has it not been declared to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and, inhabit, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He it is who reduces rulers to nothing, who makes the judges of the earth meaningless. Scarcely have they been planted, scarcely have they been sown, scarcely has their stock taken root in the earth, but he merely blows on them and they wither. And the storm carries them away like stubble. To whom then will you liken me that I would be his equal, says the Holy One. 
Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these stars. The one who leads forth their hosts by numbers, he calls them by name. Because of the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one of them is missing. The transcendence, the immensity, the omnipresence of God. We can't begin to comprehend it. We can't begin to grasp the glory and the greatness. Psalm 19, 1 and 2, the heavens declare the glory of God. Well, why is the universe so, so huge? Nine billion light years, the furthest star man has discovered. It's vast and it's mind-boggling. Why is it so big? Because God, God made it. It's not about you and me. It's about Him and His glory. If you want to, in some small way, wonder how big God is, He's bigger than the universe. The universe is to glorify Him, but He's outside of that. As vast and the glorious as the universe is, God is greater and still more glorious. He knows every star by name. He's a God who transcends His creation, is bigger than His creation, who is separate from His creation, who is outside of His creation. And this is what David is trying to help us see in these great verses in Psalm 139, the greatness, the transcendence. He says in verse 7, Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? Here he's talking about God's transcendence. There's omniscience. So there's no place that God is not. David's not saying here that he wants to flee from God's presence. He's simply using this to make a point. It's sort of like verse 1, O Lord, you have searched and known me. You know when I sit down, when I rise up. We could say that first part of the verse sets, sets the tone for the first six verses. Oh, Lord, you have searched and known me. Let me explain. What do I mean by that? And verse 7 could be the same. Where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? Let me, now let me explain. In verses 8 to 12, he kind of explains on that, expounds on that as far as what he's talking about. Now, it will be easy to read a verse like this, verse 7. Where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? And think that David is saying that God follows us everywhere that we go. That we can't run and hide from him. We can't run from him because, as he said in verse 1, he knows our every thought, so he would therefore know where we are going and would simply follow us there. But if we've in some way understood what we have been looking at so far, we know that that's not at all what he means. That's not what he's trying to convey by those questions. What David is saying here, and we need to range around, is that there's nowhere I can run to or nowhere I can hide that you're not already there. If I could jump on a spaceship and go to that star that's nine billion light years away, you're there. God is there. There's nowhere I can go. There's nowhere I can run. There's nowhere I can hide. And I don't think David is saying that, oh no, he's saying that's the great joy and truth that I, that I love. I cannot escape. I cannot be out of the presence and the protection of my shepherd. David is not saying this to, to scare us. I think David is reminding himself of this truth to comfort him and to just to rejoice that he has such a God. Why can he say, although the enemy surrounds me, I will not fear? Why? Because he knows God is there. With him. He knows it. Whether I go to the farthest star or planet or go to the lowest parts of the earth, God is there. If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. Again, he's illustrating in, their, in his mind points that would be the furthest away from one another. But there's an important verse we need to consider for a minute or two that drives this point home very clearly. And it's found in Jeremiah 23 20 and 24. And David, Jeremiah says, Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, says the Lord. Can anybody hide himself in secret where I will not see him? 
I was thinking of the story of Jonah. Remember Jonah, God called Jonah to go to Nineveh and said he went fled to Tarshish. And it says Jonah, verse 3, however, Jonah got up and fled to Tarshish. And notice this, away from the presence of the Lord. Or so we thought. And he went down to Joppa and found his ship bound for Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went aboard to sail for Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. We know the rest of the story. He never got away from the presence of the Lord at all. Everywhere he went, God was already there. God stirred up the storm. God prepared the fish. And even in the belly of the fish, God was there and Jonah prayed. But that's not the whole verse. Verse 24. Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, says the Lord. Now listen to this. Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord. Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord. It's not that I'm just everywhere I'm there in my fullness. God is not more in one place than another. Space is an aspect of God, so it is not part of God. God is fully present in every place. God cannot be divided or be put in parts. Wherever God is, he is there in all his fullness. And God is everywhere in all his fullness. God's presence is everywhere sovereignly, because God is sovereign. We read about that in Isaiah. As R.C. Sproul says, there's no maverick molecules anywhere in this universe. God is everywhere in this universe sovereignly, as ruler, as king. God is everywhere in this universe sovereignly and providentially. I think Piper calls providence sovereignty with purpose. God is not just doing things because he can do them. God is not just exerting his power and authority randomly just to prove he can do it. No, God is working all things everywhere for our good and for his glory. God is in the heavens, Psalmist says, and he does whatever he pleases. God is working all things together for good. Everything according to the counsel of his will. He's working. Providentially, sovereignly, working all things together, everywhere he is. The orbits of the stars, everywhere. God is present everywhere powerfully. God is present everywhere with authority. God is present everywhere to preserve. Hebrews 1.3 says he's the essence of the, he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. He upholds all things. He preserves all things. He preserves everything. Everything exists and remains because of God's preserving power over this universe. One day, and Peter says, this universe is going to blow up. It's going to be destroyed by fire. And I think really all God has to do to let that happen is just stop preserving it and boom. I don't know, but... But we need to remember that God is holding this world together. He's holding this universe together from the farthest star. They're all in perfect order, perfect symmetry by God's design, by his power, by his preserving power, his authoritative power, his providential power. And God is present everywhere knowingly, as we said in verses 1 through 4. He knows everything. God is everywhere discerningly, beholding the good and the evil. God is everywhere in his fullness. God is everywhere, and the God who is everywhere is a good God. This God who is everywhere is a loving God, a merciful God, a gracious God, a long-suffering God, a just God. There's no place in the universe that is deprived of the presence of God in all his fullness. Hell itself, God will be there in his fullness to judge the wicked for eternity. Revelation 19, 4, 9 says, Then another angel, a third one, followed them, saying with a loud voice, 
If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger, which and he will be tormented with fire and brimstone. And listen to this. In the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. If you could ask the people in hell, what, if we could retake one thing away, if you could remove one thing to make it less hell, what would it be? I think it would be the presence of God. God is everywhere in his fullness. And God is in hell judging judging the wickedness and the evil that men have done. The God whom man has rejected, rebelled against, ignored, blasphemed, mocked for these few short years on earth will for all eternity be tormented by, in the flames of fire, but also tormented by the very presence of God himself. And I've said this many, many times in our study that man may ignore God for these 70, 80 years here on earth, but there's going to come a time and when they die and leave this earth, in an instant they're going to realize the reality of God. There is no greater reality than God. He's the ultimate reality, if you could say it that way. But the moment they leave this earth and go out into eternity, God will no longer be ignored, denied, or mocked. God will be on their thoughts forever be they in heaven or be they in hell but you will be consumed with the reality of God you may still hate him and mock him and you will because only by the changed heart can we ever love him God, but God has to change that heart but man will be consumed with the God he sought to ignore and reject not for 80 more years but for all eternity tormented It's a very sobering thought. It's a very sobering thought. As I was thinking about these things and being probably as confused by them as you are, overwhelmed by them as you are, I was thinking of Philippians 2. And how can we ever read Philippians 2, 5 to 11 about Christ humbling himself and becoming a man? Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. How can, how can we begin to wrap our minds around him? How can we think about Colossians 2, 9, for in him, in Christ, are the, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And in him you've been made complete, and he is the head over all rule and authority. We can believe it because scripture affirms us, but we cannot conceive it in our minds. How can we wrap our minds around it? I'm glad Paul put this in 1 Timothy 3. By common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. He who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. It is a mystery. We look through a glass darkly right now, but one day the fog is going to be pulled back, but it's still going to be mind-boggling, even with a glorified mind. The majesty and the glory and the wonder that's why I think, in many respects, the Bible underwhel is underwhelming in the sense of how it describes the majesty of God and the glories of heaven and revelation, because there's no words we could even begin to, to sh help us understand or grasp the majestical glory and the wonder of what awaits God's people in God's presence. It's too wonderful and glorious for our sinful minds to truly and accurately understand fully. But what is the application of all this? We want to think about this again next week as we go through the rest of those verses. But I think there's a, a very important application that we dare not miss. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? This psalm, as I said earlier, plunges us into a reality we do not think about or meditate upon enough. And it's the reality of God. R.C. Sproul says this, 
that the big idea of the Christian life is quorum Deo. If you've ever read R.C. Sproul's uh, devotional that he puts out every month, there's a little thing on the bottom that says quorum Deo. The big idea of the Christian life is quorum Deo. Quorum Deo et, et captures the essence of the Christian life. And this phrase, he says, literally refers to something that takes place in the presence of or before the face of God. And what he's saying by that phrase, reminding us in that phrase, and wants us to be reminded of every time we read his devotional, every time we read the word of God, we are living our lives before the face of God. In the very presence of the fullness of God. To live quorum Deo is to live one's entire life in the presence of God, under the authority of God, to the glory of God. To the live in the presence of God is to understand that whatever we are doing and whatever we are, wherever we are doing it, we are acting under the gaze of God. Because God is everywhere. He's tr- transcendence is everywhere. He's omnipresent. We all live our lives in the presence of God, whether we ever give it a second thought or not. How often do you think about God in your daily life? How often do we think about the fact that we are living our lives, whether we're sitting in front of a computer screen, driving our car, eating our meal with our family, Whatever we're doing, we're doing it before the all-knowing gaze of an omnipotent, omnipresent, glorious God. How often do you think about God? He goes on, he says, To live all of life before the face of God is to live a life of integrity. It's a life of wholeness that finds its unity and coherence in the majesty of God. A fragmented fragmented life is a life of disintegration is marked by inconsistency, disharmony, confusion, conflict, contradiction, and chaos. You want to simplify your life? Remember who you are. Remember who God is there. Remember who God is and that you were created to live your life for him. And for his glory. A.W. Tozer has said, It's not what a man does that determines whether his work is sacred or secular. It's why he does it. Which means ministry work, when done for the wrong reasons, can be very secular. And marketplace work, when done for the right reasons, can be very sacred. Whatever we are to do, we are to do for the glory of God. The Christian who compartmentalizes his or her life into two sections of the religious and the non-religious has failed to grasp the big idea. The big idea is that all of life is religious and none of life. He goes on, he says, the big idea is that all of life is religious or none of life is religious. It's either all religious or none of it is. When you understand that we will live all of our lives in the presence of God, everything becomes religious. Everything becomes sacred. Because we're, everything we do, we do in, his, in his, the sight of God. We do for the glory of God. And we are to do it for the glory of God. Even the cup of cold water, as simple as that is, becomes an act of worship. We live our lives in the presence of God and the authority of God. David Murray has said, giving time and energy to our relationship with God actually increases free time and energy because it helps us get better, a better perspective on life. Recognizing there's really no such thing as secular. Everything is sacred in our life because we do it all under the gaze of his glory, the gaze of his all-seeing eyes. We all live our lives in the presence of God under the authority of God. As we've said repeatedly in our study of Psalm 139, I don't think David is writing these verses to to horrify us. I think they're great comfort to him. And they should be to us, every believer. They should be a great comfort. 
but let me ask you, are they? Do they bring you comfort? Or do they make you want to run away from God? They want to make you run and hide. They horrify you. The fact that God knows everything about us, the fact that everything, we do everything we do in the light and under the full gaze of God. You may want to run away as fast as you can, but before you do that, remember, where can I go? Where can I flee? Nowhere. You're already there. Does this frighten you or anger you or encourage you or comfort you? I pray that it comforts you. Do you need strength? God is there powerfully. Do you need wisdom? God is there in all wisdom. Do you need help? God is there as your refuge and his strength and deliverer. Do you need comfort? God the comforter is always with you. Do you need rest? I will give you rest. Do you need a savior from sin? God has provided the savior from sin in his son, Jesus Christ. He was Emmanuel, God with us. They called his name Jesus for he would save his people from their sin as he died on the cross. Christ didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. If you don't know this God, I would encourage you to run to him through Jesus Christ. Is to believe that Jesus Christ was God incarnate, and he came into this world to seek and to save the lost. To a world that was lost, who didn't care about God, hanging under the wrath of God by a thread a heartbeat from hell, a heartbeat from eternity without God, and God came in to rescue man from his greatest plight. And it was not low self-esteem, it was not bad government. He had to be rescued from God himself, from the wrath of God, because we are all sinners by nature. And we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. There's one remedy for that, and it's Jesus Christ. God laid on him the iniquity of us all. He made him to be who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So my encouragement to you is, is run to him broken, and contrite. Run to him as a sinner and he will re receive you and he will save you. And you will be gloriously saved. Wherever you are, God is there with you in his fullness. He's everywhere in this universe. Is it any wonder that David wrote in Psalm 46 to be still and know that I am God. Be still. Allow these things to, to run over your mind and meditate them on it. That's what David is, is doing here. He's thinking about the implications of these glorious truths. Even though he can't wrap his mind and understand it completely, he still knows that there's implications. Where can I flee? Where can I run? No matter where I go, you're already there. Every thought I think, you already know it. Every word I speak or remember going to speak, you know it beforehand. I can't hide. I can't run. We live our lives in the presence of God the very presence of an all-knowing and all-seeing and all-loving, gracious God. Let me ask you a question as we close. How big is your God? How big is your God? How often do you think, do you allow the thoughts of God run through your mind, or not just on Sunday? On Mondays, you get up to go to work, are you thinking about God? How can I glorify God today? No, he's your work. You'll be worth thinking about your work, obviously, but when problems come up, when you're thinking, there, you need, I need to do this, but I need to do it for the glory of God because he's here with me. He's here, and I can, I can talk to him. I can trust him. He's here in all his love and mercy and goodness and grace. He's here in his authority and his power and his majesty, and he's here with me, with you. And he inhabits eternity. He inhabits the universe fully and completely. Again, these boggle my mind. And I've almost embarrassed that I tried to, to put this forth this morning. 
But I pray that the Spirit of God will direct you to these verses and the verses we've read in Isaiah 45 and many, many other, Psalm 145, Psalm 147, that just declare the majesty and the glory of God. And we'll continue this again next week. Uh, see some wonderful, like, hopefully encouraging truths about God's omnipresence in our life. But do you know this God? Do you know him as your Lord and Savior? Do you know him as your King? It's just the God you follow and obey and love and are looking forward to one day being with for all eternity, to getting to know him more and more and more. And that will be the theme of eternity. To, uh, we will never stop thinking about him, living for his glory, that lifting up his name. His, the knowledge of the Lord will fill the, fill the earth. But if you don't know Christ, remember, you may ignore him now. You may ignore God now and choose, I don't care, I don't care, I don't care. But one day when you leave this earth, you are going to be consumed with the reality of the God you chose to reject. And you are going to be suffering in torment in hell forever and ever and ever in his presence. In his presence, you can't ignore him anymore. So I pray that if you don't know Christ, you might come to him today before it's too late. Bow your knee to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Just say, oh God, I know I'm a sinner, and I know I need a Savior, and I believe Jesus died for my sins. I want to turn from my sin, and I want to live for him. I want to follow him with my life and magnify and glorify him in all that I say and do. How big is your God? Let's just look to him in prayer. Father, we are humbled today as we've talked about these things, and but I pray, Lord, that your spirit would take these stammering words and, <clears throat> and, and, and use them, Lord, to drive home these glorious truths from your word. That our mind might be expanded and stretched as we think about the greatness, the transcendence, the imminence, the, the omnipresence, the omniscience of our great God and Savior, the creator of heaven and earth, the creator of everything that is, the master over everything that is, whose fullness extends as far out. This science has been able to take us to the nine billion light years away, but even further than that, wherever you're outside of your creation, you, you span the creation with the palm of your hand. We cannot contemplate such greatness and such bigness, if you will, immensity. But that is who you are. And may it humble us and may we be in awe that we can say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, that your Son has opened up the way into your presence through his cross, and we now have access to the Father, to the throne of grace, to find help in our time of need. Even though you already know what we need before we ask, because you know everything. We can come into your presence as your children, those who have been adopted by your grace, and call you Abba, Father. Lord, when we put these two truths together, we've been looking at that, and it just boggles our mind, the grace and the love of God towards us. So may we never cease to be amazed by grace. May we never be, cease to be amazed by the depth of your love and your long-suffering towards us. And we just pray, Lord, that we might live lives that honor you and glorify you and believe who you truly are. And look forward to that day one day when we will be ushered into your presence and be with you forever. So bless these words to our heart, we pray. May we respond in obedient hearts, hearts that have been lifted up in, in reverence and awe, and hearts maybe that need to repent and come to you in saving faith and become a child of God, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, that they might know you, that they might know the joy of sins forgiven, that they might too might give you glory and look for that one day when we will be with you forever and ever to glorify you and magnify your name. So bless us today. May your spirit work, continue to work in our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.